right, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out for Robots in Space Part 3. This is the, the third edition of this saga, if you will, about our um, ambassadors in space. And uh, this month, we're talking about Mars. Now, how many people here have been to either one of the other Robots in Space lectures? Uh, one or two? Okay, so a majority of them. So you'll remember some of these, these graphs and stuff that we've talked about. Uh, I'm Evan Zerby, who's been mentioned before. I'm the Educational Outreach Director here for the club. Um, let's talk about the differences and similarities, um, some differences, which are similarities, between the Earth and Mars. So everybody knows we have a 365 and a quarter day year. Mars is a little longer. So its year, it's almost twice as long. Uh, inclination 7.155 degrees. Um, this is equatorial uh, inclination, as well, uh, and six for 5.26 uh, for Mars. So they're very similar, um, which means we'll have very similar seasons, although not the same length. Very similar seasons. In fact, um, it's fall on Mars right now. Uh, well, uh, where uh, Opportunity is the Opportunity rover, so it's it's starting to get cold there, and they're preparing for winter. So the radius, the radius of Earth. A little over 6,000 kilometers. Now, that's twice, almost exactly twice that of Mars. So when you think about it, I mean, Mars looks quite a bit smaller, but it really is, I hate that one. It really is just twice the size. Earth is just twice the size. Now, of course, volumetrically and, and mass, there's quite a bit more, but the radius is just about twice the size. The Earth is that giant number. Um, in weight, uh, just about six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And it was much easier just to say Mars is only about a tenth the mass of Earth. Now, it's half as big, but there's only a tenth the mass. So gravitationally, there's, there's quite a difference. It's obviously uh, much larger than the moon, but it's still quite a bit less than here on Earth. So Earth's surface, 510 million kilometers square kilometers, let's say. but that's kind of a misnomer because we have this big, beautiful blue ball of what makes it blue. I mean, we're 71% covered in water. So the actual usable surface, we'll call it, of the Earth is about 149 million kilometers. Now, why is that significant? Because it's only 5 million kilometers bigger than the surface area of Mars. Mars doesn't have any oceans. So when you think of usable space on Earth and usable space on Mars, they're almost identical in size. So we'll get into the probes. Obviously, we, we want to explore Mars because it's, it's the easiest to explore, it's the closest to explore, and it's the most obvious for habitability. And that's why we've sent the most probes to Mars. Mariner 3, um, there was many missions before the Mariner, um, none successful. That includes Russian and uh, North American or US uh, space flights. And when I started out on this, I decided, well, I'm going to talk about, at least briefly, all of the missions. And, and two years ago, when we started the Robots in Space thing, and Jim and I were talking about which ones we were going to do, we said, well, let's do all the missions. Well, that was obviously impossible. And then even for just Mars, it would have been impossible to even name all the missions tonight. Um, there's been hundreds of craft just sent to Mars. Granted, most of them haven't made it. <laughs> uh, it it's called the Forbidden Planet for a reason. <laughs> Fully two-thirds of all spacecraft lobbed at Mars, whether they be landers or orbiters, have not made it. Some of them have made it way closer to the planet than was ever intended. <laughs> the Mariner 3. So, we talked about all these failures. Mariner 3 was a failure. Mariner 1 and 2, um, we don't even want to talk about them. But Mariner 3 actually made it off the launch pad. Unfortunately, we got into space. It failed because the, uh, the shroud, the casing shroud itself, didn't, didn't uh, separate, and so the spacecraft was launched uh, in orbit, actually. Mariner 4 was successful. Now look at these launch dates here. November 5th, November 28th. How long does it take us now to get ready between launches and things of that nature, especially on one program? And here they were launching you know, just a few weeks apart. First pictures from Mars came from Mariner 4. They were doozy, man. They were beautiful, these great HD images. <laughs> there it is. The very first picture, close-up picture of Mars. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't tell anything in that. 
little dark, little light, but that was the first one. And, and when that picture came back, believe me, it was very exciting. Although you could look through big telescopes back then and still see better imagery than this. So, you know, Mariner 6 and 7, um, they were launched again, you know, just a little, a few weeks apart. Uh, they, they were successful. Mariner 8, not so successful. Um, it was a launch pad failure. It exploded in the launch pad. Mariner 9. Well, Mariner 9 is significant for a reason because when Mariner 9 got there, there were two Russian probes there as well. And when they all got there within a few months of each other, and when they got there, all they saw was this fuzzy ball. Because there was a planet-wide dust storm going on. And it was important because this was the first time that not only did, did we say, hey, something's happening, but it was collaborated you know, by the Russians, and, and both of them said, you know, we, we had a little balance there. We had everybody that were bringing back the same data. So, you know, today everybody, Oh, maybe we didn't go to the moon because of that nature. Even that kind of stuff was happening back then. Specifically in Russia, they were saying, "Oh, the Americans are making up stuff. They're not really accomplishing this stuff." So when you know the two enemies, if you will, the two opposite sides of the world, were able to say, "Okay, this, you know, both of this information is the same," that really was a stepping stone for space exploration in the eyes of both sides of the world. Really, so, anybody know what that is? To space probe, sure. Some of you ought to know what that is. A space probe to Mars. <laughs> it's what? No, no, it's Mars. It's Viking. It's the first one, the first lander. It's the most expensive mission ever. Now this, this 4.77 billion that's adjusted for 2013 rate. Um, but you know, this is in 1977 dollars or something like that, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's 74, I believe it was. Now that I think about it, that, that's a big amount of money. So it's even that's almost twice as much as what Curiosity costs. And everybody's throwing a fit today that Curiosity costs two and a half billion dollars. Yet this is still the most expensive market mission ever. So Viking One landed in Cherise Planetia, um, July 76. You'll notice as we go through this, there was a lot of close to July 4th landings for U.S. space probes. Maybe it's, I don't know, camaraderie things, something like that. There's quite a few space probes that have actually landed or accomplished their mission on July 4th. You can't tell me that it wasn't planned. So anyway, uh, Therese Plantia actually means the Golden Plain. There it is. Now, pay close attention here. This is a Viking 1 picture. I'm going to show a Viking 2 picture in a minute. If you don't pay close attention, you won't be able to tell them differently. But if you notice, there's a little peak here. So uh, Viking 2 in August, so just a month apart again. Uh, Utopia, Planet Via. And there's its picture. Well, two identical spacecraft taking black and white photos of the same planet. you got to pay attention. <laughs> it took me a couple of takes to, oh, okay, yeah, they really are separate pictures. But. So here's one. Now, none, nobody spoke up and said, oh, that's Viking. So I would doubt that anybody will guess what it flew on. But this is one of those things that within my research that I do, oh, that's a really interesting fact. But there was a spacecraft that Viking flew on that was also flying at the time. Does anybody, if you, if you come up with a guess, just say it, just shout it out. Redstone? Well, that would have been the rocket. Big probe. Its mothership was a Mariner. They just took a Mariner probe, bolted this thing on the bottom of it, and lobbed it to Mars. <laughs> Both of them. Well, for those that were here for Robots, uh, Robots in Space 1, when we went through the different launches, it was literally launch failure, launch failure, launch failure, launch failure, successful, launch failure, launch failure, launch failure. And when they got to Mariner, they finally found a program that worked. In fact, there's a lot of Mariners that people don't realize. Magellan was a Mariner probe, was a retooled Mariner probe. Galileo was a retooled Mariner probe. Cassini was a retooled Mariner probe. <coughs> these were things, you know, this, these designs were from the 70s, and we still were using them six years ago. You know, brand new launches were still Mariner probes. And I didn't realize that. I knew uh, the, the, uh, the, the other satellites, but I didn't realize Vikings even flew a Mariner probe. In fact, uh, 
Mariner 11 and 12 ended up being Voyager 1 and 2. They were actually Mariners. So the Voyager programs were also Mariners. So this was a highly, highly successful uh, program. Uh, its mission was to analyze the soil and search for signs of life. Does anybody remember what Viking found? Oh, it found something. It found the absence of life. But what it found were perchlorates. Everybody was like, oh, you know, it's going to get there. It's going to work. It's going, we're going to scoop up the soil. We're going to find exactly what we think there is. We're going to think there's a microbiological life. It's going to be there. We know it's going to be there. And Viking gets there, and it finds perchlorates, which, at least life as we know it, cannot survive in. Other than perchlorates, does anybody know what else it found? Did it find any life? Sure. <laughs> now this is very important. We're going to watch a little bit here. Sojourner, uh, named after a, uh, a freed slave, um, 
that fought uh, slavery. And the land itself, after the success of the landing, they renamed it the Carl Sagan Memorial Station after his passing. There it is, a cute little guy, not much bigger than a shoebox, but very important, very, very important. Um, the whole spacecraft itself was uh, there for atmospheric, climate, geological testing. And for the first time ever, because of this little rover, we could reach out, really, and, and test something that we couldn't touch with the arm of the lander. And with every lander, you have the same significant problem. I can reach that far. Here, there's a rock I want to look at. Always. So that's why we're transitioning into rovers. Um, Pathfinder, not so near, sent back 16,500 pictures, 8.5 million measurements over its, its time on Mars. And this is where it landed. This is uh, the affectionately named the Rock Garden. And that's so near there. That is a rock called Yogi. And <laughs> so near is, has snuggled up with the rock there to take some measurements. There's a close up of it. Let's talk about Sojourner. Um, it was the first, it, with the exception of the moon, it was the first lander, or the first rover rather, on any other planet. So it was a hugely successful mission, hugely exciting mission, and really the first step into moving into the next frontier of space exploration, which is boots on the ground, if you will, or in this case, wheels on the ground. So in 97, um, the same year landed, uh, because of the success, uh, the team was awarded a special award from JPL, which is the Technical Excellence Award. And that is a, you know, if, if you're a top scientist working in one of the top departments in the world, JPL at NASA, and you're awarded a, you know, an excellence award, a technical excellence award, you've really done something right to be, you recognized at that level. October 97, it was, uh, Sojourner was inducted into the Geological Society of America, ah, Geological Society of America, as a planetary scientist. And one of my favorite parts about it, too, is he was inducted into the Robot Hall of Fame for its super successful mission and all of the things that it accomplished and the fact that it was the first rover on another planet. So this is the rock garden. Now, obviously, everybody can see all that, right? Let's take a closer look. Check out some of these names. Bar knob, Big Crater, Half Dome, Shark, Mole, Stimpy. We have photometry fats, flats, that's particle bill, yogi, dice. Some of these names are pretty creative. Pop tart. Pop tart. Scooby Doo. I mean, when you gotta come up with names, you want an entire other planet to name stuff on, you gotta get creative. I like Indiana Jones, that's probably my favorite. And the little crater, big crater, little crater. Measure. Now, I bet nobody in here has ever heard of the Major Program, the Mars Major Program, but you've heard of one track from it. Pathfinder is actually known as Major Pathfinder. Major Pathfinder was built to be the pathfinding mission to open the doors to the Major Program. And let me tell you, the Major Program was a whopper, a humdinger of crazy ideas at NASA that got funded, and I'd have to say thankfully got canceled, um, but it was called the Mars Environment Survey. Why do I say it was a humdinger? Because it was supposed to be 16 missions within a few years for only a billion dollars total. Now that's funny because it's supposed to be 16 missions and if you read the OA, which is the announcement of opportunity, which was released from NASA, it states that there's $150 million supposed to be spent on each of the 16 missions. 150 times 16 is not one billion, but that's what it's supposed to be. Measure Pathfinder, again, was Pathfinder itself. And 17 landers, 17 rovers, too. Remember, there's two craft per vehicle. So 34 total craft for only a million dollars. It was to create the planetary network, the Mars planetary network, which is actually something my research is on right now, here, almost 15 years later. And the whole idea is to be able to put probes and relay stations and sensors all over the surface of Mars to completely cover the planet, essentially, um, within an array where they can communicate with each other. And it's the first really paving the way for human habitation on Mars. To be able to go there, to be able to have an advanced weather network, to be able to have an advanced radiation network, things of that nature. 
But um, Mars Observer was supposed to be its relay station. Mars Observer, unfortunately, was one of those two-thirds crafts that didn't work out. So after um, Mars, Observ Mars Observer failed miserably, they shelved the whole project. But they'd already had Pathfinder built. Uh, so they moved it over to a discovery program, uh, which is a, another funding opportunity within the NASA hierarchy, and they went ahead and flew it under that uh, mission. Phoenix Lander, no guessing this one, I guess, right? Launched August 4th, 2007, and landed, of course, just a few months later, um, in May 25th, 2008. And it was specifically designed to search for environments that you know, life could live in. It was a polar lander. It's often known as the Phoenix Polar Lander, or at least it was closer to its uh, time on Mars. Did it find anything interesting? I should put interesting on there instead of cool, but we'll call it cool. Does anybody know what the biggest breakthrough that uh, Phoenix did? By accident. Found water. By accident. <laughs> That's a reoccurring theme in our NASA Probe project. And there it is. Do droplets on the lens of the Phoenix Lander. It sampled this, it was liquid water on the surface of Mars. Now Mars has about 1% the atmospheric pressure of Earth. Its average temperature is about 30 degrees below zero at the equator. How was liquid water, which it sampled, it's proven it was liquid water, how was it there? As, as scientists, we can't answer that question. It drives us nuts. How was it possible? We've got all these things that say it shouldn't have been there, but it was there. This is where the term follow the water comes from. This is NASA's driving force now. Follow the water in the search for life. November 10th, 2008. This is an important date. The last signal was received <coughs> from Phoenix. So what happened was winter was going along. And it's a polar lander. So winter at the pole on Mars means dry ice snow. Pretty cold. And the instrumentation inside the vehicles can only get so cold. They're made of things like metals, carbons, glasses. And glasses for telescopes, for microscopes, for um, spectrometers, things of that nature, glasses are tough to get that cold. You've got to remember, glass is a vitrified liquid. It's not really a solid. So when you get it cold, super cold, it shatters. And that happens. That's basically how we lose the space probes. They warm, they cool down to a point where stuff inside them starts to fall apart. So there's heaters inside these things. And Phoenix had two heaters in it. And they could have left one on and just turned one off. So there's this delicate balance. There's you know, solar input in um, and use energy at night. You get to a point where the arrays have degraded to the point where you're not getting enough in to get it through the night. So then you could lose one of the, the, uh, the heaters. But they decided, you know, we found water. Super successful mission. It's time to put it to bed. So they sent what's called the death command. They sent a command to Phoenix that says, Turn off the heaters, goodbye, essentially. And how this protocol goes, they send the signal to the rover, and they, they, they there's no return signal, they, or not the rover, excuse me, the lander. They send the signal to the lander, and they wait to watch the signal die. That's it. No return, nothing else. So they send the signal, and they're watching this graph. And they're waiting to watch the line dissipate, go away. And out of nowhere, they got, beep, you've got mail. <laughs> they got a return signal from the rover. This is not supposed to happen. It's not supposed to happen. It's not in the AO, it's not in the programming guide. 
It's not supposed to happen. So anybody with engineers running around trying to figure out, is it malfunctioning? Is it not shutting down? What are we going to do? What's going to happen? And that was the message. Leon, can you read binary? No. You can't read binary? It took me a while. It took me about 15 minutes to read this. I sat there and I stared at it and I figured it out. But this was the message. It wasn't supposed to do that. Some engineer somewhere put in some sort of protocol in language that if you meet certain parameters, I'm guessing finding water, this was a surprise message. So here's all these people, all these engineers, calling the hierarchy of JPL, trying to decode this, figure it out real quick what it is, and it's just sending triumph. So, certainly a triumphant mission. Did they finally drop dead? What's that? Did they finally drop dead? Yes. Yeah, that was, that was it. That was the last thing. After that, it lost the signal. Yeah. <coughs> so, on Phoenix today is encased in about 10 meters of carbon dioxide. Frozen carbon dioxide. So dry ice. Um, there was a point in time where, uh, I believe it was last summer, Martian summer, mind you, um, the Martian Constance Orbiter MRO was actually able to um, image Phoenix. It had the ice had sublimated, and they could see it, and they could see that the solar panels were all shattered and, and fallen off of it and stuff. So, pretty interesting stuff. What is the single most important Mars mission of all time? Just guess. Curiosity. Curiosity hasn't been there very long yet. My personal favorite robots of all time. The twins. The twins. Spirit and Opportunity, Mars Exploration Rover A and Mars Exploration Rover B. It's a lot easier to say Spirit and Opportunity. And we're going to watch this because of the land and that's the important part. I should have ended up the first part. That's okay. Still fun to see how it happens. So this is that fairing, that shroud that we were talking about, the Mariner 3. That didn't happen right there. Why does this spin? It's like throwing a football. <laughs> Well, it is. Now we saw how Phoenix came down, came off the parachute, fired rockets, descent rockets, and landed on the surface. It's a little different. Airbags. Now think about this. If we said human smarts and we had to use the airbag technique, so I had How did they know it was going to land like right inside out? Because they decided to. You'll see, no matter how it opens, it's called the opening pedal. No matter how it opens, you see, even though it was on its top, it's set to always, it's called an automatic writing system.
I think it's cute that they have this animated that it lifts its head up and kind of looks around. <laughs> I think it's a pretty little robot right there myself. Um, we said Sojourner was just a little bigger than his computer, just like a little shoebox. <coughs> this guy here's not much bigger. You'll see in a little while a comparison of the two. But it, it wouldn't take up maybe half the size of this table. Really still pretty small, and these guys were monstrous at the time. I and mean, they couldn't believe that it was big. The airbag system that they used was originally designed for Pathfinder. Pathfinder really was a pathfinding mission. It was the first time we used airbags, and we learned airbags can work, but they literally, they, they broke the bridges, if you will. Every time they added something new to this, they got bigger and bigger and closer and tighter to Pathfinder, so they had to redesign the Pathfinder airbag system to fit these rovers in them. So and there is a point where you just can't get any bigger. These definitely maxed out the airbag system. That's why I want to watch the landing, is there's a sequencing here of, of getting more and more accurate and more and more interesting, if you will, uh, definitely more and more crazy ways of landing on the surface of another planet. Now I want to talk real quick, it's kind of hard to see here, but there's some shiny things there and there, and there's some wires that are going through all those. Very, very few people know this, and it's one of the facts that I find very interesting. These robots were designed in consortium between JPL, Cornell University, and a robotic company called Honeybee Robotics in New York. Honeybee Uh, these launched in 2003. These launched in 2003, so they were being built in 2001. And many, many, many pieces of these were actually in Honeybee Robotics that were literally just a couple of miles from the Twin Towers. When the Twin Towers came down, and when the Twin Towers came down, there was really kind of a mutual thought that went around all these these companies that were working on the rovers almost at the same time throughout NASA that they should do something really special. So those little brackets right there are pieces of the Twin Towers. Pieces of the Twin Towers. Al aluminum uh, brackets from the Twin Towers. Uh, they were picked up. A guy from Texas uh, flew up there, picked them up, went to Texas. They weren't melted down and reformed. They were hand hammered. They didn't want to change them. They didn't want to melt them down. They wanted them to really hold the significance of the fact that they were a piece of the Twin Towers. So they, they hand hammered them and they formed them into shields uh, for the wire, uh, the wire guns. Each rover has one of them on it. Each rover has a US flag on it and each rover has a patch. They either have armor martian or damage on it. But these, these little shields right here, the shrouds for the wire harnesses, were made from pieces of the down -level. Very special for everybody that worked on the program, especially Honey Robotics, which was there through all of this. So let's talk about these guys. Mars Exploration Rovers, the MER team, everybody uh, within planetary science to be first to miss the MER twins. I'm spirit opportunity, everybody obviously knows that. They were hands down, and are hands down, the most successful NASA mission ever. They were originally designed for 90 salts, it's a Martian day. 90 salts, 90 salts is 92 Earth days. They were only designed to work 90 days. They figured they might get a couple extra out of them. But you'll see here in a little bit, at one point in time, one of the rovers was dying in only 80 sols, and they considered that a successful mission. So only supposed to last 90 sols. They landed uh, April, or excuse me, um, January 4th and January 25th of 2004. So they did not very, you know, two weeks apart, three weeks apart, something like that. Still working today. Now that's obviously only correct for opportunity. Spirit, unfortunately, got stuck here a couple of years ago, and it was stuck in an orientation where its solar panels were not angled at the sun, and it was winter was coming along, and it froze to death. But 38 times the expected lifespan, how they said today. Now, all these numbers we're going to look at about the odometry and the things that nature of opportunity were at are for today. They are today's numbers. So, nine years, 113 days as of today. It was supposed to last. 90 days. So, 3,398 souls when it was supposed to last 90. I find that amazing. <laughs> uh, their surface geology, uh, very little uh, atmospheric stuff on them. There's a little bit, very little. And that is 
between those of us that are trying to design the geology missions and the other big group with the atmospheric missions and planetary uh, sciences, that's always the fight. How do we get both of them on, or I don't care about their mission, how do we keep them out of our hair so we can get our mission there? And um, the landers were atmospheric. Um, there was two others that were supposed to be big atmospheric ones, the polar lander, which they programmed in, they measured in feet and programmed in meters. So it thought it was a few million miles further. Um, stuff like that. So the atmospheric, they got their missions too, but fortunately for us geologists, the geology missions are the ones that have survived, um, which is a good thing, of course. This is uh, Gusev Crater, which is where the uh, where opportunity is. Well, landed. It was where it was supposed to die as well, but hey, they had all this extra time on its hands. It's done a little trap. <coughs> This is, a, and I, I apologize, I forget the name of the little girl, uh, but this little girl got to name them. Spirit of Opportunity. That's an actual picture from one of them, I don't recall that anymore. I don't even know that it's been marked. Again, Spirit was M-E-R-A, Mer a and Opportunity is Mer b Real money collector geologist. Study the rocks and soils for clues to past water on Mars. Now, what does that mean? There's things in geology and mineralogy specifically that can occur that can only occur in a liquid oxidating environment water hematite is one of them um, there's a few more chlorates a few other things so it was there to search for the chemical signatures of past water not to look directly for past water even though interestingly they found some pretty interesting stuff total cost for the missions is 820 million dollars so let's think about some of these other missions that we've had 4.77 for Viking. Viking only lasted a couple of months. Um, now we're going to take Voyager out of this because when it comes to missions, Voyagers and the twins, they're really they're really in their own league. But Voyager is still in several billion dollars. $822 million for two missions. That next summer will have been there 10 years. Moving! <laughs> you know, not just landers. Um, they've had six mission extensions for $144 million total. It's, and as long as they keep going, I think it's pretty well set um, that they're going into pain. Uh, launched in 2003, again landed in 2004, in January 2004, 90 day missions. 4.35 ground time, now, Spirit. I said that they were planned for 90 day missions. <coughs> day 80, the biggest problem on Mars is the dust. Dust is really kind of misnomer on Earth, dust is mostly skin cells. Skin cells, little mite, you know, little things in the atmosphere. On Mars, it's all rock. It's actually what's called regular. But I even put on here somewhere soil. It's not right. Soil is organic. It's tiny, tiny, smoke grain sized dust. So it hangs in the atmosphere. It's only 1% atmosphere, but it hangs in the atmosphere very easily. It's also much less gravity, so it hangs in the atmosphere very easily. This stuff settles on everything, namely when you're a solar robotic, you know, space probe, it's the solar panel. So if there's a lot of wind, a lot of dust gets kicked up, and it lands on your solar panels. This is what happened here. Massive dust build up around day 80, and they never expected to get past 90. They figured day 80, we got close. They, they were very, very happy with it. In fact, they started shutting down the program. Like, okay, there it is, you know, we'll go to skeleton group. But then on day 91, they got another, you've got mail. Hey, I'm back. What are we going to do? The rover come back live. Well, how did this happen? They couldn't figure it out. You ever seen a picture of those little Martian dust devils? One hit the rover and cleaned it off. <laughs> so it came back. And this is what's happened time and time and time again. They're called self-cleaning or automatically cleaning events, wind cleaning events, there's our atmospheric cleaned events, there's all kinds of names and nicknames for them, there's no real solid official name for them. But Mars keeps cleaning off our rovers. It's killed everything else. Every other project we've sent to Mars, Mars has killed it. But these rovers, this is why these rovers are such a big deal. I mean, they have just kept, they're the energizer bubbles, if you will. 
So it was planned to move 600 meters. Eh, to the stop sign, maybe. Down there in the team. 0.4 months, not very long. <coughs> Spirit, being the one that's been gone the longest, still managed to clock 7,730 kilometers instead of just the little 600 that it planned. So like I had said, it landed in Gusev Crater, but and it died somewhere else because we had all this extra time on our hands. May 1st, 2009, 21.6 times its original design mission plan. It got stuck. Like I said, got stuck. Sun's over here. It got stuck on this side of the hill. And in 2010, communication was finally lost. The batteries had drained down enough. There was not enough recharge during the day. And we, we lost it. So now Opportunity has done some different things. They each headed different directions. They each were on different parts of the planet, which I think we'll see here at the end of this. Um, again, 90 souls. Currently 3,398 as of today. 38 times. Spirit died at 21 something. 38 times the original mission link. Planned 500 meter. Now, Opportunity was the one that they had actually figured it was. Opportunity was literally the problem child. Spirit, they built it, they put it together, they tested it, they took it to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, which is where we launched stuff like this. They put it in what's called ATLO, which is the final stage. It's literally the room on top of the rocket where you put it together, you wrap it up, you put a bow on it, you put the ferry on, and you send it to Mars. Spirit, wait, wait. Opportunity fought every single step of the way. This happened, and this happened, and that happened. At one point in time, they didn't know if they had put the exploding bolts on the thing for the solar panels to open. So they had this huge rush going on. Opportunity was the problem child, and originally only planned to go 500 meters. But it's gone a little tiny bit further. 38,198.04, that's the official odometry at the noon today. 23.37 miles, 77 times its original planned total traverse distance. Pretty impressive. It's now at Solander Point, which is a long way away from Gusev Crater where it landed. And it's waiting for winter. I said it's fall, winter's coming along. So what it's now done is as the inclination changes um, for the seasons, it has placed itself on the side of a mountain that will get the most solar exposure direct rays to the solar panel that it can for its current position to be able to make it through the winter. And it will pretty well just hang out on that side of the mountain, or the hill is probably what it is. It'll just kind of hang out there. It'll do some stuff. It will do some roving. It'll do a little research. When winter comes, it will go into a sleep position where basically all it does is charge during the day and run the heaters at night and take atmospheric samples. And then a few months when spring comes along, it'll wake up again on about its thing. We hope, we hope it'll wake up again. Um, I was doing a little reading into, as of May, we had 538 watts of total solar array power, and right now, I think we're at 331 or something. So it's, that could be because of atmospheric conditions and the fact that, you know, it's fall, that the angle uh, of the sunlight is changing. It also could be uh, severe degradation and the solar array. So uh, we won't know until winter, really. Or until spring, excuse me. In June, June 21st, I was actually teaching my class this summer about Mars exploration when this happened. So this was a very neat uh, hallmark to make. Five years now, that's Martian years. Five Martian years on the red planet. Martian years, remember, were 600 and something total days. So, um, Next year, um, in just a few months here in January, it'll mark 10 Earth years. 10 Earth years. 2007, I told you that Spirit and Opportunity both were there to find signs of past water. It found current water. In 2007, Spirit had had all kinds of problems once it got there. An opportunity was the problem child here and then it turned out great there. Oh, so like real life is that time. Spirit had a wheel issue. Um, at one point in time, 
its rear right wheel, it's a six wheel vehicle, they both are, its rear right wheel had stalled something in the motor, the motor's bearing something stalled it, and it wouldn't move, and the robot wouldn't move. And days and days and days went by, they're trying to figure out exactly what to do it, and eventually they decided it had been a great mission, let's just wing it. And they sent a driving command, they, they just uh, disconnected the power serve to that wheel. They sent a driving command, sent extra power to the other wheels, and it just drug its wheel across the surface of Mars. Broken not all care to help it at all, drag it. And it did, and it took off. And when it drug it, of course it didn't roll nicely across the top, it dug in a little. And when it dug in a little, it exposed ice. Right under the surface. Another accident. So, and then in July, July, again, July, yeah, run. What is the difference between past water and water at present? Remember what I said, that past water is <coughs> signature, is, is, is what we say. Um, hematite, iron oxides of certain, uh, certain molecular construction, um, chlorates, things that have to form in the presence of water, that don't form any other way. If we find those, we know there was water there once. It wasn't there to look for current water. It was there to look for old signs of water. But it found current water, you know, all by accident dragging its foot along the margin soil. But it didn't find any past water. It did, sure. Oh, well, it didn't find any past water. Past water is gone, uh, you know, as theoretically. It did find the signatures, though. Um, in fact, Sp uh, Spirit found these little things that we call blueberries, which are hematite balls. Um, they're about, the, about half the size of a BB, and I, you know, a Pelican-style BB. Um, and they, they're hematite, hematite 3, and, and that is, you know, conclusive evidence that water in that particular area. This is caused by condensation then? No, no, it would have been liquid water and it's technically an iron precipitate. So think about taking an old car bumper that doesn't have any and throwing it in a big vat of water for a while. That eventually there's going to be stuff that grows off of it and that's essentially what this is. So if, if you have more questions about it, we'll, we'll talk about it when, it's, uh, when we get to the question section. So anyway, so 2007 Spirit found water and in 2008 Phoenix found the water running down its leg by accident. So both of these cases were by accident. You know, can you imagine being sitting up there and just, what is that? Oh, I better take a picture. <laughs> so it directly sampled the water in the Martian soil, and while it was doing that, it found water running down its leg and sampled that. So. Now everybody knows curiosity. This is obviously the most current. Uh, curiosity is actually known as the Mars Science Laboratory. Now, we saw how Phoenix lands, we saw how um, Pathfinder lands, we saw a bigger version of the Pathfinder landing for Pathfinder, Pathfinder landing uh, used by the, the twins, the rovers. Now, I said that the twins maxed out the airbag technology, and the next things we need to consider are how are we going to put humans on Mars. Curiosity is just a little bigger yet than the twins, so this is how we do it. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. It's a very natural thing. It's incredible to look at it. It's it is the result of recent engineering thoughts. It still looks crazy. The top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, that takes a step. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away. So when we first get word that we touch the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle is alive and dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. And her descent landing, also known as EDL, you refer to as seven minutes of terror. Because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars. Going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero. In perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing. And the computer has to do it all by itself. Well, it, if anything, it's a 
Yeah, no glitches. Just right. It's game over. This family with the atmosphere develops so much aerodynamic drag power and it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicles are only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but it's also very guiding that an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint. This is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing. One that we have never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that I've ever built today. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's the next snapping nine channels. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time for the rest of the landing sequence will work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it only slows down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice. We've got to cut it off and it come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, we want to do something. We're going to smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical maneuver. We fly off to the sun, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting them over, moving straight up and down so we can look at the surface with this radar, see where we're going to land, and straight down to the bottom of the crater, right beside a six kilometer high.
I believe they've got control up to the point where they, they uh, jettison the back shelf, which is, I think, 13,000 miles or so above the surface. But that's still only a couple of minutes from the top of the atmosphere. And after that, it's on its own. So it is also a mobile robotic planetary geological laboratory. It has more atmospheric on it, which is one of the reasons it was so expensive. Um, it's more rocks, more water. Seems to be a pattern here. Not a lot to study on Mars. We got atmosphere, rocks, look for water. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Most accurate pinpoint landing ever in the history of humanity. No question about it. Hands down, this thing took the cake. Cost to date, it's a little higher than that. It's actually, I looked today, 2.59 billion. So close to 2.6 billion. Um, it's way over budget like everything anymore. Launched November 26, 2011. You saw there that it landed, for those that you were uh, at the landing party, um, uh, in August, 1031 Pacific. So it was just after midnight here for us. Uh, last year, last fall. That is not supposed to be there yet. Anyway, what is the difference about MSL? MSL being the Mars Scientific Laboratory, Mars Science Laboratory. It's nuclear, baby. No more solar cells to worry about. Done. It's nuclear. There's a what's called an NMRTG. Those for you remember. RTG stands for uh, Radio Isotope Thermoelectric Generator. This is the largest RTG ever built. Pioneers are nuclear. Uh, Viking was nuclear. Voyager was nuclear. They all run on a little slug of plutonium. And this guy does too. That stands for multiple mission radioisotropic thermoelectric generator. It runs on 11 pounds of plutonium 238. Oh no, that picture you got. Well, I'll show you the picture in a little bit. It's pretty neat. It's a picture of the, the reactor actually glowing inside the rover. Landed in Gale Crater right next to Mount Sharp, it's a kilometer high mountain. Um, it will be at the base of Mount Sharp in probably another month and a half or so. So the idea is it's basically to climb up, do some stratigraphic work, um, stratigraphic work. And it's looking to find schnapps. No, not Dr. McGillicuddy's, but schnapps are the basic molecular biological makeup in chemical names of all life as we know it. So SCHNOPS actually stands for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. It's there to look for these things together um, to be able to, to show there could have been life here or there could have been some form of organic compounds that could have been life. It communicates directly to Earth. It can use the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter um, to relay, but it doesn't have to. It has a seven watt X-band communication system on it that uh, broadcasts directly into the deep space network. No need for relay time. Its speed, 90 meters an hour. That doesn't sound very fast. That doesn't sound very fast, but that was, all right, let's go back. That was light years faster than the twins because their average speed was about a centimeter a second, which works out to about 90 feet an hour. So the difference here, or 30 feet, so yeah, 30 feet. So that's quite the jump. What else is important about that? We can go further. We can go faster. We can drive at night. We no longer have to huddle down at night and not do anything because we're using up the power, you know, on the other rovers, you sat during the day and you charged up, you did a little bit of stuff, and then at night you just huddled down, didn't use any power because you had to run the heaters. This doesn't have that problem. 15 years, it's got power for as long as it wants it. It's about 2,000 watts. So the instrumentation, this is one of the huge differences. Um, the twins had just a couple of instruments on them. I mean, they had a bunch of little things, but the big instruments, they had the APXS, uh, a mass power spectrometer, and they had uh, a couple of spectrometers and a uh, microscope, basically, to take close-up pictures of, of rock type. So this is a quick rundown. Um, the, the antenna, this is the RTG 
here, that big deal that hangs off the butt of this thing is the nuclear reactor. Um, Dan, Rad, Marty, uh, Molly, HXS, Kim, Kim, Sam, they just sound like they just started throwing names in the thing, but they all work out. We'll talk about them here. So this guy right here is the mass cam. He got really creative with the cameras. Everything ends with cam, so you know exactly what to do. The mass cam has quite a few things in it. It's got a pan cam here. It's got um, a telescope in it. It's really neat. Uh, the imager is actually this way. So then we've got Kin Cam, which is this guy. Looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Uh, this is the thing, if anybody ever heard of Curiosity last year, like it landed, oh, now it's shooting a rock with a laser. That's what Kin Cam does. It shoots a rock with a laser, vaporizes a bit of it, and then reads the light that comes off the dust. Nav cams. Can anybody get those? Do? <laughs> Navigational cameras, um, optical cameras. That's a picture from one of the nav cams. They're not very cool to look at. So uh, rims which is one of these really obscure ones, the radiation thing. Has cams, has cameras, it has eight hazard cameras. All in total, it's got 34 cameras on it. It's just a few more than the other rovers. Uh, and obviously much better resolution than the other rovers. MOLLE, which actually stands for the Mars Handling Imager. This is MOLLE right here on the, the arm of the robot. Uh, it looks really weird because you've got on the arm of the robot there's this big head of stuff. No pinchers or no scoops or anything like that. They're closer to the body. So this is the head of the robot here. Um, and it's, uh, you can braid a rock and then the hand lens. You know, as a geologist, we take our hammer and we smash a rock and we piece up and you do this, you know. We look at the rock. Well, that's what this guy does. It's a hand lens. ATXS, which is a mass power spectrometer instrument, stands for alpha particle x-ray spectrometer. Really exciting stuff. Um, Kim Min, that's the chemical, um, geological chemistry and mineralogical camera. This is a, an x-ray diffraction picture of some of the rocks that take taken to Marty, uh, which is the Martian descent imager. I thought that was pretty neat looking. It looks like something that came out of the 50s. But um, SAM, which is a, another measuring device, and DRT is the dirt removal tool. Um, the RAD actually stands for uh, Radiation Assessment Device, and DAN, which is the uh, Dynamic Albedo Neutron Detector. Albedo is one of those obscure geology things. What is the biggest difference, other than all of these instruments, the fact that it's got a lot more instruments, the fact that it's nuclear, what's the biggest difference between Curiosity and Sojourner and the Twins? Any ideas? Money. True. <laughs> Size. Is he ignoring my commands now? Young. That's Sojourner. Little shoebox. Cute little guy. I would love to have a copy of this thing. One of these days I'll build a model. But, and there is, uh, there's our little half table side robot there. That's one of the twins. Our model of one of the twins. And there's Curiosity. It's the size of a small SUV. Largest object ever launched um, at anything, really, uh, with the exception of the Hubble. Um, it is enormous. It's a ton. It's, it's a huge, huge nuclear powered buggy on Mars. Yeah, is this a fun little animation here? This shows you the Phoenix Lander up here in the bowl, like you can make one path under Opportunity Spirit. Gives you an idea of where they are on the planet. Spirit's hiding way back there in the corner somewhere. I just thought that would be a fun animation to show everybody where it was. Okay. Well, thank you for listening to, to Robots in Space here. Um, does anybody have any questions? All those burger ones, do they uh, have all kinds of things left over? Do they just remake the. Uh... Um, you know, that's a really good question. Let me turn some lights up here. That's a really good question. Um, my guess is. No, I'll just make up. There we go. Uh, my guess is they rebuilt them because they were all a little different. Um, yeah, I believe Mariner 1 through 3 were one type, 4 and 5 were another, 6, 7, 8 were another design. Um, no, and I said that uh, Cassini and Galileo and Magellan were all Mariners, but they were they were really big, uh, Mariner offshoots. Um, silly, uh, yeah, silly, I, I definitely call them silly. Um, there were certainly things that were different. I mean, they couldn't just take a regular Mariner and, and ram a, a Viking on it, she sent it to Mars. So there was some things that were different. 
but they were certainly the same basic design. Absolutely. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Each meters problem. Uh, I uh, yeah, I probably did say that. Yeah. So, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. All right, thank you.